Hello everyone and welcome to our step one video on cellular adaptations. It's time for another introduction. Students, this is my beard. I know, pretty awesome. And while we're on the subject of beards, let's talk about some beard etiquette. Number one, never grow a beard after your girlfriend dumps you. You don't look tragic or sensitive, just kind of pathetic. Anyway, no one really cares that you got dumped. Number two, no hipster beards. If you grow a beard because you thought it would look good with your skinny jeans and a faux retro Pink Floyd t-shirt that you got from Goodwill, then you fit the Webster's definition of a hipster. Trust me, it's in there. No need to look that up. Number three, step one beards are okay, as long as you don't complain about how tired you are. You're growing that beard as a sign of strength, not because you're too tired to maintain a minimum level of bodily hygiene. Send me a pic of your step one beard on Twitter and I promise to repost it. Ladies, sorry if I've neglected you in this intro. Though I would advise against it, you can always scare up some testosterone and grow your very own lady beard, which again, I promise to retweet. All right, let's beard on. All right, so today, today we're talking about how cells adapt to injury and to stress. Now in the video on inflammation, we talked about tissue responses, but now we're looking more at the cellular level. Now we're going to see that cells can become stronger to withstand further injury or cells can be replaced by new cells. And then we'll look at what happens when cells are irreversibly damaged. And then we'll also look at cells uh, when they kind of get to that give up stage where instead of fighting back, they just sort of wimp out and atrophy. All right, so let's move on to hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, you've probably heard the saying, which uh, does not kill us makes us stronger. And that's actually Nietzsche uh, who said that. Well, how do cells and tissues become stronger in the face of injury then? Well, they can undergo either hypertrophy or hyperplasia. Now, this is really basic, but hypertrophy means the individual cells get larger. And as a result, the whole organ gets larger. So, for example, if you exercise and work a muscle, that muscle will respond by laying down more myofibrils, which makes each individual muscle fiber stronger, and it also makes the entire muscle bigger. So, in general, hypertrophy occurs, uh, is going to occur due to that production of more cellular proteins. Now, another example would be hypertrophy of the uterine muscle, so the myometrium and that's during pregnancy. Now, obviously part of the reason that the uterus gets so large during pregnancy is because there's a big baby in there, but even before the baby gets very big, during early pregnancy, hormone changes cause the uterus to lay down myofibrils, and the cells become hypertrophy. Uh, and this is to strengthen that muscle uh, for when it has to contract and push that baby out. So again, this is hypertrophy, but here the stimulus is an exercise, it's just hormonally induced. So hypertrophy can be a beneficial adaptation, but it's not always. And now one example that you'll see again in cardiology is myocardial hypertrophy. So there are a couple of different reasons why the heart muscle would hypertrophy, but the most common one is gonna be chronic hypertension, uh, where the afterload is increased and the left ventricle has to work harder to push blood against that increased afterload. And so those myocardial cells hypertrophy. Now this does help the cardiac muscle get stronger and maintain output, but over time it makes the ventricle stiffer and less compliant. So then the ventricle can't relax and fill as well as it should, and eventually this leads to diastolic heart failure. So hypertrophy can be a maladaptive, self-defeating process in many situations. Now let's go over hyperplasia. So what is hyperplasia? How is it different? Well, instead of getting bigger cells with hyperplasia, you get more cells. And when you increase the number of cells, the overall organ can get larger. So the cells aren't any bigger, there's just more of them. Now again, these changes can be triggered by hormones. For example, again, during puberty, girls start producing more estrogen, and this causes hyperplasia of the glandular tissue of the breast, and as a result, the entire organ gets larger. Now, estrogen also causes proliferation of the endometrium as part of the menstrual cycle. Now, we'll talk about this in more detail in the reproduction section, but also remember that progesterone counteracts this proliferation. So if you don't have that progesterone, then this estrogen-driven proliferation becomes endometrial hyperplasia. And this increases, unfortunately, your risk of endometrial cancer. Now, hyperplasia in and of itself is not cancer because it's a controlled process. But anytime you have cell division and cell proliferation, uh, there can be a chance that cancer uh, can develop in that situation. So, some stressors trigger hypertrophy and hyperplasia, but what happens if cells are stressed and injured to the point that they die? How can they be replaced? Well, sometimes they can't, and sometimes they can, uh, and that brings us to stem cells. So stem cells are a pretty hot topic ethically as well. Uh, so what is a stem cell? 
Well, basically a stem cell is a cell that can renew itself again and again, and then some of its daughter cells can differentiate into specific cell types. While even, then again, other daughter cells actually retain this ability to self-renew as well. So a stem cell is able to divide into a precursor cell that goes on to be a new cell, whatever that cell is needed in that situation. So think back to the zygote. So it's a single cell. Now, if you were to split that zygote in two, would it develop into half a person? Well, no, those cells are still undifferentiated stem cells. So they can keep dividing and they can eventually differentiate and turn into anything later on. And that's why when that zygote splits, if it does, uh, both cell masses survive and they keep dividing and growing and you get identical twins. So at that early stage, every cell has ability to grow into an entire organism. Now let's fast forward maybe a week, maybe longer. You've got a blastocyst. Uh, you have a hollow ball of cells with an inner cell mass. Not very many cells yet, maybe uh, overall maybe about 100. Now those cells in the inner cell mass aren't differentiated yet. Uh, they still have the capacity to become any tissue in that fetus. Now these are called the embryonic stem cells and they haven't yet committed to any particular cell lineage. Now, at some point, those cells do become committed. Uh, they'll uh, still be stem cells that will divide and make a lot of different tissues, but they become committed to making just maybe endoderm-derived tissues or ectoderm-derived tissues and so on. Now, eventually, we have stem cells that are committed to being neural cells or blood cells or whatever the case may be. Let's also think about your bone marrow. It has to be able to constantly make new cells, even now. Now, leukocytes get used up fighting infections. Red blood cells last for maybe only about 120 days under even the best circumstances. So in your bone marrow, you have multipotent hemipoietic stem cells. Again, these are multipotent, so they have, uh, so they have that potential to become multiple different types of cells. But they are hematopoietic cells. So no matter what they become, you know it's going to be a blood cell of some type or another. They can't go on to become liver cells or neural cells uh, because they're partially differentiated. But they do still retain some stem cell ability. So here's your multipotent hematopoietic uh, stem cell, uh, and it's receiving a stimulatory signal from the body that says, we need lymphocytes. So this stem cell can grow and divide, and one of those daughter cells is going to differentiate into a lymphoid precursor cell. And it's going to be committed to becoming a lymphoid cell, whether it's a B lymphocyte or a T lymphocyte or maybe an NK cell. That hasn't actually been decided yet, but it is committed to becoming a lymphoid cell. But this daughter cell is going to somehow retain its multipotent self-renewing property. Uh, so instead of becoming a lymphoid cell or whatever, it's going to just now grow and divide again and again and again. And that's what makes that stem cell special. Now, one other interesting thing about stem cells is that uh, we've discovered that you can take an oocyte and remove the nucleus, and then if you transfer in the nucleus from another cell, uh, just a regular cell, you can create an embryo with embryonic stem cells that have the donor cell's DNA. And then you can culture those stem cells and get them to differentiate into pretty much whatever tissue you want. So this is called therapeutic cloning, and it's how they've been able to clone sheep and cats and water buffalo and all sorts of things. Now, this is still a long way off from actually being practical, but it's uh, pretty interesting to think about being able to maybe grow new organs for transplant or to grow new pancreatic beta cells uh, for patients with type 1 diabetes or a million other things. All right, let's switch gears. Let's talk about metaplasia. So another way that cells can adapt in response to injury is called metaplasia. Now metaplasia is a reversible change where one cell type is replaced by another cell type. Uh, and this, that's as a response to some kind of ongoing stressor. Now, there are lots of common examples of this. For instance, the trachea and the bronchi are normally covered with ciliated columnar cells. But in smokers, that normal columnar epithelium is replaced with squamous epithelium because the squamous epithelium is uh, tougher, better able to kind of handle the exposure to smoke and to toxins. But there are potential downsides to this. First of all, there's a reason that we have that ciliated epithelium in the first place. Those cells produce mucus, they trap toxins and microorganisms, and then the cilia uh, help to push the mucus away from the lungs uh, to keep those toxins and pathogens from reaching the lungs in the first place. So when you replace that columnar epithelium with squamous epithelium, uh, then you have less beneficial mucus production uh, and you can't clear it as well either. So you're more likely to get respiratory infections. Now the second downside is that these metaplastic cells are unfortunately a setup for a transformation into cancer. Uh, 
Now, another form of uh, metaplasia that you should be familiar with is called Barrett esophagus or Barrett uh, metaplasia. So this is where in the, uh, the normal squamous epithelium of the lower esophagus is replaced by columnar epithelium, uh, which is similar to the epithelium in the stomach and in the intestines. So this is sometimes called intestinal metaplasia as well. Uh, remember, metaplasia is in response to some stress or injury. So what's the injury in this case? Well, in this case, it's chronic GERD, gast gastroesophageal reflux, uh, where the lower esophagus is exposed to a lot of stomach acid and other gastric contents. Now, the thinking is that the columnar epithelium uh, is more resistant to those acids. But again, with metaplasia, there's a risk of developing cancer. So Barrett esophagus is a precursor to esophageal cancer, specifically esophageal adenocarcinoma. So how does metaplasia happen? Uh, are you somehow changing differentiated squamous cells into a totally different cell type? Well, no, that would be like making a hepatocyte turn into a neuron, so that doesn't happen. Now, what's going on with metaplasia is that uh, local stem cells in the area are being uh, induced to make a new type of cell, although the exact mechanism isn't quite understood yet. All right, so let's move on to atrophy. So we're moving on to another pathological phenomenon, uh, uh, atrophy. So this is shrinkage of an organ or tissue. Now, this is due to reduction in the size of individual cells and or because of the reduction in the number of cells. So it's the opposite of both hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Now, you're probably already familiar with disuse atrophy, so muscle atrophy that results from not uh, using that muscle. So if you've ever had a broken bone, you had to wear a cast for, say, six weeks, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, what did your arm or leg look like afterwards when you had that cast removed? All weak and nasty and shrunken. Uh, so that's atrophy. So uh, disuse is a cause of atrophy, but there are lots of other things that can cause atrophy as well. Decreased hormone signals, for example, in women after menopause, uh, the vaginal epithelium will atrophy uh, because of a drop in estrogen levels. So the vaginal epithelium becomes, th uh, becomes thinner, drier, it can actually become more ir uh, irritated and even bleed and get painful. Again, that's called atrophic vaginitis. Now, you can have atrophy due to a loss of innervation. So if you have a spinal cord injury or some peripheral nerve injury, uh, then the muscle will atrophy and get smaller. Now, an inadequate supply of oxygen or nutrients can also cause atrophy. If you don't have enough nutrients because of uh, malnutrition or malabsorption, then you won't be able to maintain the size of the tissue. It'll get smaller, and that's atrophy as well. And then finally, increased pressure can cause atrophy, and that's due to tissue compression. So, for example, if you have an enlarging tumor, it can compress the surrounding structures. It might uh, disrupt blood flow uh, to those structures and then produce atrophy again. All right, so what's going on at the cellular level? Well, initially there's a decrease in cell size and a decrease in the number of organelles. And you're also going to see a reduced metabolic activity. Now, basically, the cell is trying to conserve energy and resources, and there's a decrease in protein synthesis and also an increase in protein degradation. So you're not making more proteins, and the proteins that already exist are kind of getting degraded down, usually by the ubiquitin uh, proteasome pathway. Now, when there's disuse and nutrient deficiency, the cell starts to uh, attach ubiquitin to its own proteins, and then these get dismantled by the proteasomes. Uh, and then just like a starving person will begin to digest his or her own uh, kind of muscle for energy and then uh, get muscle wasting, a starving nutrient deprived cell is going to really start eating its own organelles as well. It's going to uh, take its own components uh, in a desperate attempt to survive. Now this process is called autophagy, uh, which really just means self-eating. And most of the digestion is done by the lysosomes, but sometimes the lysosome isn't able to fully di digest uh, what it needs to, and then you get residual bodies as well. Lipofusin uh, is a yellow-brown pigment that forms when there's kind of partial degradation of lipids, uh, specifically by free radical uh, oxidation. So the lipids don't get completely digested and cleared, and then you kind of see this kind of atrophied cells, and they kind of fill up with all these lipofusin granules. Now, the last major change that a cell can undergo is senescence, or just aging. Now, we said atrophy occurs when a cell doesn't have something it needs, like hormonal signal or a nerve signal or nutrients. But what about cells that do have everything they need? Why don't those cells just kind of live forever and ever and ever? Well, for starters, cells have a fixed number of times that they can divide before they just kind of quit. Uh, even cells in culture uh, that have everything they need, once they reach their limit, they stop dividing. 
Now the culprit here is that on the ends of our chromosomes we have long non-coding DNA sequences called uh, telomeres. And those telomeres protect the ends of the chromosomes. But every time the cell divides, those telomeres will kind of get clipped off a little bit. So with every round of mitosis, those telomeres get shorter. And basically, the shorter the telomeres, the older the DNA and the older the cell. Now, once the telomeres get too short, uh, the ends of the chromosomes kind of get exposed and the cell sees that, a DNA, uh, sees that as kind of DNA damage and the cell cycle gets arrested. So the cell will stop dividing. Uh, now, there's an enzyme called a telomerase uh, that can uh, add to the telomeres to keep them from getting shorter. Now, germ cells have t a whole bunch of telomerase. Uh, stem cells have a ton of telomerase as well. Uh, but in mature somatic tissues, there's virtually no telomerase. So as those cells divide, the, the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. But where else do we find telomerase? Well, unfortunately, cancer cells. So one of the things that cancer cells uh, do so that they can keep dividing is that they figure out how to start expressing a telomerase again so that uh, they can keep their telomeres nice and long. And that makes the cancer uh, basically immortal. And we'll talk about that again when we get to the oncology section. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the lecture part. It's time for that end of session quiz. Pause that video, try to go through those questions yourself, and then we'll go through the answers together. All right, first question, does the compensatory growth of muscle fibers occur primarily as a result of hyperplasia or hypertrophy? So if you do a lot of working out, you're gonna get more hypertrophy. Next, does myometrial growth in pregnancy occur primarily as a result of hyperplasia or hypertrophy? Again, the answer is gonna be hypertrophy. All right, next question, what can happen to the cells of the lower esophagus in response to chronic acid reflux? Remember, they can undergo metaplasia, and that's moving from a squamous cell to a columnar uh, epithelium, and that's uh, referred to as Barrett metaplasia or Barrett esophagus. Next, what is actually occurring at the cellular level uh, during atrophy? So there's a reduction in the number of organelles, you get decreased protein synthesis, you get increased protein degradation, uh, usually by the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. You can have autophagy, remember that's that uh, self-eating, as the cell begins to kind of digest its own components in the attempt to uh, uh, find more nutrients and then survive. And then there's also lysosomal degradation of cellular components as well. And then finally, what is the uh, lipofusin granule? So that's a residual body within the cell that contains yellow-brown lipofusin pigment uh, that comes from incomplete free radical-induced uh, uh, lipid oxidation. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of our video. I hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.